Hi and welcome to this video on bonding. So this is probably the biggest, wordiest topic what you will encounter for Chem 1. Uh, make sure you pick up all your marks on the moles questions because it's quite likely no matter how good you are, you're probably going to drop some in terms of the words on this. So I'll jump straight into it. The intramolecular, so these are the, the big compounds where everything's joined together. There are three types which you've probably heard at GCSE. Covalent, metallic and ionic. If you learn definitions for these, then you can apply them to more or less all the properties within them. So the covalent is a sharing of a pair of electrons. Make sure you get a pair in there. If you do not, you drop marks. The metallic. Metallic is the strong attraction between the nucleus and the sea of delocalized electrons, or the strong attraction between the, the positive metal ions and sea of delocalized electrons, whichever you wish. Ionic is the strong electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. So I'll go into some of the, the properties with them now in terms of the structures and more or less looking at how to explain them. So your covalent, you've got two different types of covalent structure, either the macromolecular or the molecular. You'll sometimes heard it described as giant covalent and effectively just them, the, the simple covalent. So the macromolecular is things like diamond and graphite and silicon oxide. So things which more or less extend off taking up all the carbons in the, the actual molecule. Whereas the molecular is something like oxygen, which you're breathing in now. So in that, you've just got the oxygen double bonded to each other. You've got other oxygens floating about, but there is no intramolecular bonds between them. There is just the, the weak intermolecular, which we'll come on to. Now, for describing the properties of them, so there's four main properties which you should be aware of melting point conductivity malleability and solubility so being able to describe them whether or not they do don't and importantly why so macromolecular melting point very high why because covalent bonds are strong and there are lots of them so there is lots of strong covalent bonds which you need to put in energy to break therefore the melting point is high do macromolecular compounds conduct no reason why there is no free electrons and well not sorry no delocalized electrons or no free ions the exception to that is graphite Graphite, between the actual hexagonal layers, there are some delocalized electrons. So graphite's your exception that you need to know for the macromolecular which does conduct. Now the malleability, well think about it, if you try and bend diamond, what happens? It's gonna break if you apply enough force. It's one of the hardest substances there is. So mac macromoleculars are not malleable. If you try to bend them, then you've got to supply enough energy to break those bonds, and all that happens is it breaks and it shatters. So they are not malleable, because you just end up breaking the bonds. Do the macromoleculars dissolve? No, again, if you put something like carbon, as in the diamond, or graphite in water, it just sits there. The reason why, they are typically non-polar. So there needs to be some sort of interaction for, well, sorry, for solids to actually dissolve in water. So macromolecular, not very soluble, at least in the polar solvents. Now for the molecular, melting point, very low. Most of them are gases at room temperature. If you get onto the long chain hydrocarbons, they'll probably be liquid, extremely long. You might get up as solids, but low in comparison. The reason why, is you, you don't need to break as many strong bonds. Usually you've only got to break the actual intermolecular. So van der Waals, dipole, dipole, hydrogen bonds, which we'll come on to, whichever are there. So the molecular bonds are much weaker and easier to break. Do they conduct? Well, think about it, there's huge gaps between these molecules. So there's no free ions, there's no delocalized electrons bridging that area. There's nothing to actually carry the charge. So the moleculars do not conduct. Malleability, well, you can't exactly bend gas or bend liquids, things like that. 
So they aren't malleable, and even if you froze a molecular compound, got it all the way down, that the van der Waals actually kept it together. As soon as you supply enough energy to try and bend those van der Waals, you would just end up breaking it, similar to the macromolecular. Solubility, quite poor, again, because of the fact there's not going to be many interactions with the polar compounds. Now, the metallic. Metallic have a high melting point. If you want to explain why, just give the definition. There is strong attraction between the positive metal ions and C of delocalized electrons. Do metals conduct? Yes. Why? Well, they have a C of delocalized electrons that allows current to flow. Are metals malleable? Yes. Reason why for that? You should know how to draw a basic lattice style structure for metals like that. So within this area, we've got delocalized electrons. So these positive metal ions do not touch each other. What happens is the layers can slide over each other because of the delocalized electrons between here. So obviously look at the chair, what you're probably sitting on. The metal has been bent and curved. Force was supplied and it just caused the layers to bump and slide over each other and actually bend. So metals are malleable. Now, as for solubility, metals, it depends on the actual metal. Usually they would end up just actually reacting with the water. Um, the metals which are in the water which you drink, they're typically in the ion form. So you end up with the ion dipole interaction with water for solvent. Ionic, ionic melting point high, pound for pound, usually higher than the, the covalent bonds, but diamond obviously macromolecular, one of the ones which tends to stand out for people. But sodium chloride, potassium chloride, things like that, high melting point as well. If you want to explain why, give the definition. So there is strong electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions, therefore you need to put in a lot of energy to break them. Um, ionic, do they conduct? They only conduct when they are molten or dissolved. When they are solid, effectively in the... in the lattice structure. You should be able to draw these as well, by the way. I'll show how nice and simple. Draw your flat square like that, positive, negative, negative, positive, so opposite charges are next to each other. Extend it into 3D like that. And again, just make sure opposite charges are touching each other. So in there, the ions are held in a fixed position. So if they can't move, then the positive can't go to the negative electrode. The negative ion can't go to the positive electrode. So it doesn't conduct. However, if you melt it, so obviously start weakening the attraction, allow these ions to move, then they can go to their, their opposite respective electrode. Or ditto, they are soluble because the ion dipole interactions with the water so obviously the positive there can interact with the delta negative on oxygen and the negative there can interact with the delta positive on hydrogen so that's why salt sodium chloride dissolves and obviously if the ions are free to move then it can conduct so it's one of the reasons why water actually conducts because it's usually these dissolved in it so rather than the pure water itself is this malleable? No. Well, when you want to try and bend something, you supply force to move it. If we knocked all of these across one, then the positive would be here, so it would be next to a positive. And the negative, which was across here, that would be pulled across next to a negative. So the opposite charges would be next to each other, and they would repulse each other. So obviously the entire structure in there would just all break apart and it would all fall down. Uh, so that's all the properties for the, the intramoleculars. Um, in terms of why things form covalent and ionic bonds, that brings in electronegativity. So electronegativity has a big part to play in the intermolecular forces, but I'll say what it is. 
So electronegativity is the power of an atom to attract the shared pair of electrons in a covalent bond. So the covalent bond is where they share electrons. The ionic GCSE, you've usually heard it, is the transfer. Now for why it's a transfer, you can kind of think of it in terms of two atoms are playing tug of war for the electrons. If they are pulling each other evenly, then it's a covalent bond because one cannot take from the other, so they decide to share. Whereas ionic compounds form when one side is much more electronegative than the other and it ends up just ripping the electrons away. But even if you just had things which were oppositely charged ions meet, even if the negatively charged ion had not taken the electrons from this positive, they would still attract to each other and form ionic salts. Right, so now on to the intermolecular forces. So be very careful with this terminology, by the way. If you are talking about something like magnesium, or just generally calcium, sodium, any of the metals by themselves, you are looking at metallic bonding. Never mention the intermoleculars with them. Ditto, if you are talking about diamonds, silicon dioxide, things like that, never mention intermolecular. These are between two discrete, separate molecules. Whereas the metallic, it's all one big lump. Ditto diamond, all one big lump, things like that. So, as I said, this is probably why some people are going to worry a bit. They end up writing too much and dropping marks because of that in the exams. <clears throat> Right, so the three types of intermolecular forces which you need to be aware of. Van der Waals, otherwise known as London dispersion, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonds. So van der Waals are temporary instantaneous dipoles. The way they arise is if you've got your atom, the electrons do not go around in a nice neat orbit. They are randomly whizzing all about. Think um fat guy doing a hula hoop so if he's got a hula hoop when he swings his hips out to one side all the fat flies to that side so it's the same thought with the electrons there is a possibility that all the electrons could fly to one side of the atom so because of that if all the electrons fly to one side of the atom so all the fat from the dude doing the hula hoop then this side has a delta negative they say obviously delta positive. The reason why they talk about induced, obviously induced, if you whisper in somebody's ear long enough to burn things, they probably will start doing so. If there is another molecule about, or another atom, depending on what you're talking about, then the electrons in this will be repulsed by that, will move over there. And we now get attraction between the delta positive and the delta minus. The reason van der Waals is by far the weakest force, electrons do not want to be next to each other. As soon as they are there, they repulse, they move apart. So van der Waals very weak and it's based on the amount of electrons. So if something has more electrons, it will have more van der Waals because if I move 10 electrons into that region, then obviously my delta negative for 10 electrons is gonna be bigger than my delta negative for two electrons. So that's how you can sort of compare why the, the boiling point of the noble gases goes up as you go down the group, because more electrons, more van der Waals. Right, dipole, dipole. So this ties in with the electronegativity. So these delta signs, effectively, this is electron deficient, this is electron rich. The reason why, they are not equally sharing the electrons. Electronegativity, power of an atom to attract a pair of electrons in a covalent bond. Tug of war style, 
If something, if you've got two of the same, two oxygens for example, even tug of war, electrons sit perfectly in the middle, no dipoles. Dipoles form when there is a difference in electronegativity between the atoms. So the chlorine in this case has a bigger electronegativity. It's got a bigger nuclear charge. So the factors what you look at for that are things like the nuclear charge, the electron shielding, um, the atomic radius, just like with ionization energy. So chlorine pulls the electrons slightly towards it. Now the difference isn't big enough for it to be ionic. It's only a small difference. So it's still a covalent bond, but it's called a polar covalent bond because the electrons slightly shifted towards the chlorine. So if two HCl molecules meet, there is going to be attraction between those molecules. So this is why HCl effectively, um, as opposed to say, um, just pure hydrogen, you can compare sort of the different melting points and boiling points in terms of looking at the intermolecular forces. Hydrogen bond. Now a hydrogen bond is basically just a stronger version of a dipole-dipole. There's nothing really that different about it. So there is the hydrogen bond between two water molecules. Hydrogen bonds are the strongest of the intermolecular forces. So this explains why water is a liquid at room temperature, whereas something with, say, dipole-dipole forces might not be, because hydrogen bonds are stronger than dipole-dipole. The reason why is the electronegativity difference between these two is bigger than between these two. So this delta sign, it's more negative than the delta negative there. Whereas this delta positive is more positive than the delta positive there. So these signs are effectively moving more towards a full positive and a full negative than these. So there is bigger attraction between them. So because of that, I need to put in more energy to break them. So it explains one of the anomalous properties of water, that is, melting and boiling point are higher than expected compared to say hydrogen sulfide. So hydrogen sulfide as you can see looks very similar to water yet the melting and boiling point is quite drastically different. This would only form dipole-dipole bonds, delta negative and delta positive with others whereas this can form a hydrogen bond, which is much stronger. Um, yeah, so just make sure you don't get intern and tram mixed up. The only thing which I can think of which I left out is dative covalent bonds. So a dative covalent bond, rather than a shared pair of electrons where one electron comes from each side, a dative covalent is where both of the electrons come from one side and are shared with the other. So an example, so boron trifluoride there, the boron's electron deficient, it's only got six electrons round it, it needs some. If F minus comes along, then what it can do is it can donate and share both of that lone pair with the boron. So make sure when you are answering these questions, by the way, donate the pair into the sharing and say who from and who to. Because um, the way it's typically shown would be like that. So if ever you see an arrow on the diagram pointing towards it, that's telling you the data covalent bond, the, the fluoride which came in, so I remember my negative charge there, the fluoride which came in donates both of the pair of electrons in that co data covalent bond. Um, I think that's everything ways through. Obviously the shapes I'll do in a separate video, I think I'm about to cut out for time. And yeah, that's all bonding.